Welcome to the Up Arrow Podcast with William Harris, featuring top business leaders sharing strategies and resources to get to the next level. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey everybody, William Harris here. I'm the founder and CEO of Element and the host of this podcast where I feature experts in the D2C industry sharing strategies on how to scale your business and achieve your goals. I'm excited about the guest that I have today, David Breyer, best-selling author of Brand Intervention and Google's number one ranked rebranding expert. David's rebrands have generated over 7 billion worldwide. Uh, He is a native New Yorker and Google's top ranked rebranding expert. David's four decades of branding expertise are sought after by companies of all sizes. In addition to David's work being featured at Adweek, Fast Company, Forbes, Inc., Huffington Post, Entrepreneur, Thrive Global, (gasps) I Need a Breath, The New York Times, and numerous blogs and podcasts the world over, he is the recipient of over 320 international awards, including the rare honor of being presented the Presidential Ambassador for Global Entrepreneurship Medallion. David, it is fantastic to have you here today. Well, dude, thank you, William. I mean, this has been a long time coming, and I'm thrilled, man. I'm thrilled. I mean, we, we're not likewise. We're, we're, we're not. We've actually been we've been friends and 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 sort of you know colleagues ish, sort of in that sort of in that space for well, I don't know several years at this point. Yep, um, I can remember when we first met. I think it was through online, and then we ended up uh, connecting in person. Invited you out to Minneapolis, uh, kind of shared a stage together, and so yeah, we've gone way back. Um, and I don't want to uh, unnecessarily interrupt uh, you giving some praises over this way as well. That was very nice. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going to do the uh, sponsor here real quick. Yep. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Element. Element is an award-winning advertising agency optimizing e-commerce campaigns around profit. In fact, we've helped 13 of our customers get acquired, with the largest one selling for nearly $800 million, and one that IPO'd recently. And we were ranked as the 12th fastest-growing agency in the world by Adweek. You can learn more on our website at element.com, which is spelled E-L-U-M-Y-N-T dot com. That's it with the boring stuff. On to the fun stuff. We are going to be talking about what's possible with branding in today's world. Yep how to recognize that you have a branding problem, and how to fix it. I've got a bunch of great insights from your Amazon bestseller. Let me just show everybody the book. I have it right here. Um, Brand Intervention. You've got another new book on the way. We'll talk about that one a little bit later. Let's start off just talking about a little brag time here. You've worked on doing branding for Estee Lauder, Rolling Stone. You were telling me about uh, one client that you had 300% growth in 30 days without launching a single new product. How? Well, the, the, here's the, the thing that probably many of us take for granted is what is it that first gets, let, let's look at it really simply in, in a granular way. How does something first get onto our radar? It's not because of a pitch or a campaign or an offer or this, that, the other. It's like, what's that, what's that little lever, the little first lever that actually even gets them on our radar rather than just being one of the thousands of messages that we get every freaking day, right? I mean, we get bombarded, right? You, you get you and I and everyone yeah, totally. listening to this, we get texts, we, get, we go on social media, we get pre-rolls, we get mid-rolls, we get post-rolls, we just boom, 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 boom. Some belly rolls. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You got holiday rolls, you know, that was yeah. going up. And so, and so, you know, it's like, what is that thing? And, and it, is, it is this element that that thing was different enough. And I'll give you a, a fantastic example. Like, every, like 2023 has been the year of AI, right? Mm-hmm. Everything, yeah. everything AI, everything AI, and which, I, which I find interesting from one standpoint and pathetic from another standpoint. It's interesting because it shows it's a lot of potential. But at the same time, the internet, when it first came out, was a lot of potential. And, and, but sure. the, the first step out of the gate is crap. The first step out of the gate is just the, and everybody, everybody, despite their, there's no, there's no uh, barrier to entry. So anybody with no talent, no judgment, mm-hmm. no experience can enter as quickly as someone with a lot of, a lot of judgment, et cetera. So we've got this whole thing, but I literally saw in my email um, just a little bit ago before I came to the office. I got this thing and it talked about um, it, it, it positioned something as like promptless AI. I was like, now, wasn't that interesting? Because all of a sudden it's like they took AI. Like, mm. How the hell do you differentiate AI? It's like it seems almost impossible. 
Promptless AI. Whoa. Now that elevates it into a whole new realm. Like, whoa, this does this AI mind read? Is it psychic? What the hell is the deal? <laughs> but the but the but the little trigger and the point about this is it's different. It was different. It wasn't just, hey, we got really better AI, or we got AI that sounds more like you. Everyone's pitching, trying, that's going to sound more natural and organic. And that, but it was like promptless AI. Okay, that was a differentiator. We mm-hmm. notice differentiations. We notice things that are distinct. We don't notice. It's like we don't need another flavor. You know, it's like, what's the thing that's different, right? So, you know, and that comes from everything from, your product offering, your service offering, as well as how you communicate it. Are you doing it like like these guys, like these uh, this chocolate brand, mid mid uh, midday squares? You know they've exploded, and they came onto the onto the marketplace. You know where it's been dominated by Hershey's and Mars, and the, and there's been like basically four key chocolate companies that have dominated the space. But they came in as a as really it's a a woman her husband and her brother. And it's the three of them. And they are rebellious. They are raw. They are unfiltered. And they're like, their whole thing is, we're going to come in because it's spite because everyone needs like a bit. It's like, we all can use something better instead of being dominated, boom, 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 boom. And so they're coming at it with like absolute, they're fire breathing beasts. And they got, they got no filter, man. I mean, you think, you think I got a mouth. These guys got, (laughs) these guys are loud. But it's differentiation. Differentiation yeah. is how how we did it because on that particular brand, I mean, it literally was one store, boutique chocolatier, and they and I looked at what they were doing. And this is and I'm a you know me I'm a I'm a real when it comes to being chalk like good chocolate. I want only artisanal, amazing, high quality, good good dark chocolate. And I'm and and for those that are listening, yes. Do I love a Reese's peanut butter cup? Yes, I do. Okay, let's. Yes. But when I want to actually get serious about just sitting and enjoying, man, a really good handmade truffle or something like that, that's amazing. And these guys made amazing stuff. But their stuff, their box looked like crap. It was, first of all, it was flimsy, it was crappy. I already knew that their audience was 85% women. I already knew that. I was like, and, and I, I came from a family where I have two brothers. Now, I married my wife out here in the Midwest. She had two sisters. Okay. And so I watched whenever the sisters got together, I watched with fascination. I just watched how they interacted. I found this fascinating to me. It was like, it was, it was like, it was like a little mini documentary, a spontaneous documentary. I'm like watching it and learning. Right. And so I found this fascinating, the stuff they could talk about and this, and the, and just the things that seemed tangential, but to them, it was like the entire universe. And yeah. so I built an entire brand, the box and everything. And it was, the box was sturdy. I made a box that would have an afterlife in the home because I knew that this was that women were the audience. So I was going to have really cool, tons of cool chocolate trivia, little bits, little ridiculous bits of facts and things that you didn't know about. Because I, at the same time as some people were, approaching it like cosmetics. Cosmetics is all about appearance. It's theater. It's like it's, it has an aura of everything while saying nothing, right? Mm-hmm. It's how it smells sure. and how you touch it, how you feel it. Ooh, the paper. Ooh, the foil stamping. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It's, it has all these little ooh, yeah. but it doesn't say anything. It's, it's like this aura of magnificence. You know, it's kind of mm-hmm. like if, if if Kim Kardashian were a box, that's what cosmetics would be. Because, you know, it's not like Kim Kardashian's ever shared with us, hey, I have something that's really going to change the quality of your life. No, she's she's like, well, she has, a, it's, it's, she has a, a particular stratosphere where she exists. But it's not deep, right? It's a particular sure. layer. Well, that's sure. what I basically did with these guys. And it was crazy. The bo- they, Literally, the box was sitting on the back counter. There were no new sexy people. There were no new flavors, no new products, no change in pricing, no, no promotions, no change in hours, nothing. The same people that were coming in for their coffee and espressos, tea, scones, muffins, chocolates, all this kind of stuff were coming in. But this box sitting on the back, they're like, oh, I'll take one of those. Oh, I'll take one. It blew them away because of the aesthetic, because it went against the grain. It was absolutely mm-hmm. different, unlike anybody else. 
And they literally saw a 300% increase in truffles. And then the fi- and this was, by the way, in the summer when sales are, of chocolate is low. Sure, sure. Wow. I think the, the takeaway that I have from that that you talked about is how, you know, different is what gets our attention. It's what's good. And, and that can be different in a good way. It can be different in an abrasive way. There's a lot of different ways that it can be different. There's every flavor um, different. That, that there, absolutely. It could be, yeah. be different in an ugly way. It could be different in a snarky way. It could be different right. in an aesthetic way. It could be different in a volume way. I mean, it's, it's, sure. absolutely, totally. But different cuts the noise. And, you know, I think about other brands that have done very well with this. Uh, Liquid Death has done very well with that. Like, absolutely. Abrasiveness. Yep. Um, and, and I just like the idea of you were talking about like that gets our attention. And I'm thinking about uh, the way that we, let's say our brains work from a survival perspective. I've, I've heard it said that we think logarithmically. Um, we, can, we can understand the difference between one wolves, three wolves, and nine wolves more intuitively than we understand the difference between, you know, three, four, or five wolves. Because there was a big difference logarithmically to understand the difference between one wolf, uh, maybe I've got a chance, three wolves, I'm slim chance, nine wolves, I don't have a chance, right? But like three, four, five, it, it didn't matter as much to think linearly. And so it's, it's that compounding difference that I think cuts through the noise from a survival basis. So I, I like where you went with that. No, you, you actually make a very, very important point, which is it's like some – Companies or brands will want to take, let's take, let's take an incremental move. Let's do something. Let's sure. do just a little. I'm like, and, and I will challenge that. I'll say, do you want an evolution or do you want a revolution? I say, mm. you're trying, don't expect re- exponential return on tentative, on tentative initiatives. Let's be, let's play us little, let's do a little safe little, it's, you haven't moved the lever enough to know. I mean, and, and, and this comes from even when I've had, when I've worked with um, with with people in my company, and I'll say, "Hey, I, I need to see this in a couple of little colors. Ch- make this make this blue, or make this more red, or whatever like that." And they'll move the they'll move whatever is the is the the dial like a little bit. I said, "Dude, <laughs> move the dot. Let's push it far this way. Push it farther. Let's see which way it goes, and then we can back sure. it down, and sure. then we we know where it's headed." I said, but they, they, they literally, they take this little tentative. It's like, what do you think is going to happen? You think the computer's going to blow up? Move, move the freaking thing. Let's see where it's headed and, and let's discover. We can look, yeah. we can assess, but because if you don't take such small incremental steps that it's like, well, something happened, but we don't know what caused it because the move was so subtle that basically sure. you had to put it under a microscope to detect anything. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, the entrepreneur in me loves the go big or go home kind of approach. Um, so let's talk about for brands who are looking at this, what are the warning signs, the telltale signs that you need a brand intervention that, that branding is the thing. Cause I'm, I work with brands all the time and we are making a lot of those incremental changes and that's what we should be doing is, you know, uh, people who are managing their ad spend where it's like, great, let's test this ad versus this ad, this landing page, this landing page. And there is some value to that, but there comes a point where you say, this isn't the answer anymore. We, we've, we've done what we can do within reason here. You need this bigger play. What are you looking at that you'd say, this is the sign that it's time for brand intervention? Well, the first thing I want to, uh, the first um, myth that I want to absolutely blowtorch the hell out of, out of existence is oftentimes when that's being done, oh, it, there, it becomes a, 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 an exercise in let me look in the mirror and see if I can detect something. No, how it's like it's like it's like this. Let's say you're going to an event and you're like, well, I and I want you know I really want to stand out at this event, and so I you know I want to make a statement. I want to like you know I'm going to the I'm going to the Met Gala or something like that, and I want to make a statement. And so now there's two ways you can approach this. You can approach it and you can look in the mirror and say, how can I be different? How can I be different? How can I be different? And you can keep asking the freaking mirror and the reflection and just keep looking at yourself. You're not going to make a lot of progress, which is what a lot of companies do. It's like, how do we know whether we should be there? No. How are you going to have the insight necessary to know if you need to make a shift? Now you need to look. Okay, let me look at the guest list. Let me look at who's going to actually be at this event. What, do I, what intel do I have with regard to what they're going to be wearing? Now, with that information, I can now make an informed decision. How far do I need to pivot? 
a lot, a little, big, small, mm-hmm. bro- bodacious, you know, or very nuanced. So that's the point. It's like the first thing you have to do is you have to look and take inventory of, okay, if we're not making the kind of progress we want to be making, if we are plateauing, or yeah. if the competition is starting to increase and the noise is getting, oh, now others are copying us, very common, because if you're going to get any level of success, people are going to copy you. Well, you, the, the only way to stay ahead is to stay ahead. Let me repeat that. The only way to stay ahead is to stay ahead. That means you need to be moving. That, needs to, that means sure. you need to be looking into the future, not like tentatively, where it could be maybe, but, but, but. The, I cannot emphasize enough. You need to, those of you that are listening, you need to slay the living shit out of tentative you know, little, a little, ooh, let's tippy toe and like, let's be this cautiousness. You know, look, you can, you can do what you need to do. You could do the testing and you could do all that stuff. But if you don't have enough clear, bang, we really reached out into this direction, yeah. reached out into this direction. And these are clearly different from one another. You know, how are we going to actually be able to conclude anything? And how is the audience out there going to be able to differentiate and distinguish us from our competition? So, you know, it's be bold. And being bold doesn't always mean being loud. It doesn't always mean being obnoxious. It doesn't always mean dropping F-bombs like Gary Vee. That's not what I mean by being bold. I mean, have conviction. Take a stand. Wherever your stand is, you may be a hardcore traditionalist in your in your space. You know, we're really traditionalists. Well, then be the most hardcore traditional traditionalist there ever freaking was. That's the kind of fire you need to lean into it. Or you could be anything, but do it with conviction. Do it not in a tentative way. And do it with boldness so that you know where you stand. And the people out there can actually hear you. And you can get on their dial because tentative shit is going to get you tentative shit results. Yeah. yeah it actually reminds me of something that is in your book here uh, that I have dog-eared. I have so many pages dog-eared from this. Um, you wrote, there's a law you must know. If your brand's using cliches, you're promoting your category, not your brand. Yeah. And I like that because that's that whole like uh, – generic stuff that's not making a difference unless you actually kind of like you said take a stand be bold yeah and here's and here's this one little little other nugget i'll I'll share with you and and the listeners is that you know when people talk to me about about brand loyalty and various things of that nature i tell them you know the one brand that, that i that i would absolutely never want to ever 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 be under the sun would be walmart and they're like what and i'm like yeah you know why because walmart Actually, they don't have any any customers that are loyal to the Walmart brand. They're loyal to the low price. If another company mm. came along and said, hey, anything you can get at Walmart, you can get for 5% cheaper at our place, those people are going to split because the only differentiator they have is price, right? Sure. And so the people are loyal to the price, not the brand. Walmart happens to own that and, and because they're negotiating and, the, and their business model and all that kind of stuff. But I wouldn't want a, a brand that was not that had n- no customer loyalty to my brand. They're only loyal to the lowest price out there. Yeah, that makes it hard to compete. Yeah. So let's talk about this. So you need to know your brand. Yeah. Um, I've I've said before to people that I think you can get to ten million without having a really massively clear brand. Now that's hard, and that's not true for everyone. But I I think that you can do that. And I've seen a lot of people do that without having a very clear brand. Um, but you can't grow beyond that without having a clear brand. Um, how how are you thinking about developing that clear brand? What are others that you're seeing in the space? Or, or like, how do you go from having a kind of brand to a very clear brand? What's that process? Well, I mean, I mean, the basic thing is 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 if I can't identify what your brand is, like for example, it's like. I mean, what's the difference between an Apple iPhone and a Samsung? Technically, technologically, probably not a lot. Not much. Not much. But there are those who are absolutely freaking diehard loyal to Apple, right? Mm -hmm. It was, it started out, first of all, it was connected with a human being. 
in my experience, some of the best brands and sustainable brands actually do have a human voice. In other words, we certainly, for those of us who have been around, we know, okay, Steve Jobs, Apple, mm -hmm. great. Richard Branson, Virgin. Um, Harley Davidson, it's like not, not as much, but the bottom line is, is but, the, but the individual, Harley is so connected to a lifestyle that that individual on the open road is the human connection. Um, sure. You know, and, you know, and you could look at, you could look at tons of entrepreneurs. You could look at Mark Cuban. You could look at Damon John. You could look at Grant Cardone. You could look at, you look at the, the Spank CEO. You could look at all of these, all of these individuals. To me, there's a, there's a human quality that if that's, if that's there, that makes it a hell of a, a lot easier. Now, when I say human quality, let's, let's, let's raise our IQ a little bit and recognize this. When I get onto my Delta airline and I see the CEO delivering that stupid thing, you know, delivery, helping people, sure. you know, one flight at a time, blah, 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 blah. That is, a, that is an empty jacket. That is a void. That that, there's nothing human there. There's nothing. There's, yeah. there's no personality because we as brands must have there must be a clear hero and a clear villain. If you don't have a clear hero and a clear villain as part of your brand story, you your growth will be absolutely limited, completely. Mm -hmm. You've got to have something that I'm like, yeah, man, they got my back. I love that, right? Yeah, and yeah. and I and I hate that crap too, right? I mean, so you know, it's like it's like you know, liquid death. It's a very clear. I mean, even, yes, they have a, they have their personality, but. Besides the personality, and it, and I love I love their language and their marketing. They they're just off the charts crazy. Absolutely, you know. But they've taken water and put it in a can. I I mean, what it's like? What is it? But yet, yet, they ended up they ended up with this. You know, getting a hundred. I think it was a hundred twenty five million dollar. Uh, you know, like uh, investment, like not in funding, not too not too long ago. So yeah. it's but it was clear who the who the hero was and who the villain was. So I will tell you, I mean, it's like, I mean, what, what brands do you like? Well, I mean, yeah, Apple, you, you've mentioned Apple, Apple, I'm a diehard Apple fan, right? I've got everything Apple. Me too. Um, and beyond that, I'm not a huge brand loyalist. I'm not a huge just consumer, which is an interesting thing, right? Um, I think I like to approach things very, very, uh, very methodically when I go to do this. So I, I am the person who will create the spreadsheet of all of the different options and try to find the one that is the right option for me. Seriously? This creates, oh, absolutely. Oh, and speakers? it's annoying. And it's, for it's, it's, it's uh, well, yeah, I mean, for just about anything, um, <laughs> which is, I will say is a problem. It creates a, a analysis of paralysis of sorts for a lot of things. And, and I struggle with some of those things, but if it's Apple, I, I don't think twice about it. I'm like, yep, that's the one I want. Yep. I don't have to even compare the future features. Yep. 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 Um, you talked about even with, uh, you know, having this enemy in there and, and Apple in its early days did that as well. Now they don't do that as much now, but they did that. They had the enemy. They had the 1984 commercial. Yep. They ended up having like the Mac versus PC sort of thing. Yep. Um, and I think in order to understand who your enemy is, you need to understand your audience. And I think that's something that Liquid Death did a great job. To your point, and this is a quote that you have in your book as well, um, David Ogilvie said something along the lines of like, there's literally not much materially different between the different products, the different detergents, the different waters, the different whatever. The difference is knowing your audience, knowing what they see as a hero and what they see as an enemy and how can you make sure that you align towards those things. Yeah, yeah. And, that's, and that has to do with values. This is a this is a point that too few. Again, so many companies will be oh, well here. Like I'm sitting and I'm talking to them. Let's say we're going to determine whether we're going to work together. So tell me, tell me, and I ask them. Here's the question I will always: If I end up, if if any of your listeners and I end up ever working together, you will hear this question from me. That that is this: Why should I, as a prospect, choose to do business with you? Why should I choose you instead of all your competitors? And then I proceed to listen. Sometimes mm -hmm. that answer is five minutes long. Sometimes that answer is 30 minutes long. But I let them answer the question. After which I thank them. And then I ask them, I say, now let me ask you something. Why do I know that if I went to any of your competitors, that they would pretty much have a very similar, if not identical answer to what you just told me? 
because the differentiators, the, 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 the reasons that they think are the, are the reasons, you know, it's like, oh, well, we're, you know, it could be anything from, well, we're family owned, we're made in America, we're, um, you know, uh, we've, we've, uh, we've invested X amount of hours, uh, X amount of money, we've, uh, we've done this R&D, we've had it tested on, uh, you know, on, on, on uh, Siberian, you know, you know, lions. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know, it's whatever. And so, and so that is the thing. It's, they're looking in the wrong places. Mm-hmm. And, then, and you're never going to come up with the right answers looking in the wrong places. It's like the guy, it's like that scenario. Looking in the mirror. You can ask that mirror 40, 45,000 times. You will not get a legitimate answer for what you should be wearing at this special event to achieve the end result that you want to achieve. You're mm-hmm. looking in the wrong place. Yeah. You, you brought up this idea, too, of where are we looking for the right answers? And I think sometimes in D2C, the place that we try to find answers are in the nuances of data. And that's not wrong. Um, but I think sometimes we're only looking at the subset of data that we have, and we're not looking at the data that we don't have. And so when we're looking at the data we have, it forces us to want to make these smaller incremental changes. Um, but we're not looking at the data that we don't have. And by not seeing that, I think that we miss a part of the bigger picture of where we're going. And, and to me, when I think about the importance of branding, I see the plateau that you've talked about. I see that come up where it's like, great, we've, we've nuanced this as much as we can within the ads platform. There's only so many more changes that we can make. We can maybe get you know, another 1%, 2%, 3%. But like, we're not going to make another 30%, 40%, 50% gain. Like, and then you're adding on channels, but then you've added on most of the most big channels. And it's like, what are you going to go to now? Reddit? Fine. There's some value to be on Reddit ads as well. Like, we can continue to expand out channels, but there's only so much that you can do there. And the thing that's missing is this branding and this positioning that's taking place that makes people say, I absolutely have to have this. When we talked about lifetime value, we talked about how it increases brand loyalty, how to increase brand loyalty with LTV yep. and what LTV is really measuring. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and see, and, 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 and he, well, here's, well, here's the thing. I mean, it's like, so yeah, but let's, yeah. So we can, we're, we're still recording. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing, yeah. The, the basic thing with, with, with lifetime value is, you know, no business, no business is built on a one-time sale. It's built on, okay, I actually, I gave you a reason. I gave you a compelling reason to first engage with me, a brand. Now I need to give you continuing reasons why you should engage with me. And here's the amazing thing about that. Most companies will look at branding from the standpoint of, you know what, it's going to be, it's going to be like, we're going to attract the client. We're going to close the deal. We're going to, they're going to complete their, their online sale and Mm -hmm. we're going to be happy. Well, that's good. You've, what you've done right there. And this, and here's the crazy part. Most companies think that that's successful. I consider that I, first of all, that's not only not successful, that's the beginning. That's not the finish line. That's the starting line. So what happens is, is that's, and that's literally only two thirds of the actual branding p- pillars that actually make up the relationship. We have pre-sale branding, during sale branding, mm. and post-sale branding. One of the things that's amazing, post-sale branding, is where we have the opportunity to leave not only a lasting impression, but to really build a relationship. The more a single brand builds in future into every action that they take, future, that means like, Mm -hmm. whoa. I mean, isn't it rewarding when someone says, I mean, look, you've experienced this, I've experienced this, anybody's experienced this. It's like, like, how did they know I needed that? It's like Mm -hmm. they're inside my head. That's pretty powerful. Well, that's post-sale branding. That's where you go, bang, yeah, we attracted your attention. We treated you like gold. So you were, you, you, it confirmed, it blew away any like possible, eh, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. Takes you to the, to the first finish line, which is actually the starting line. Mm-hmm. And now we arrive at a special place, a special place where we now get to prove that they really made it. One of the great things, you and I being advocates of Apple, loving Apple, one of the great things that I love of Apple is the amazing engineering that goes into their boxes. 
when I unbox a product, it's yep. like it fits like a freaking glove. It's and it's and it's the material is amazing. The, the every corner is perfect. It's not sloppily put together. That is post sale branding. Do they need to do that? No. Does any other brand do that? No. They try. Some uh, aspire mm-hmm. to, but that what does that do? That confirms you know this eight hundred dollars, this three thousand dollars, whatever the hell the price tag is. This this is why I spent the money. It confirms. Yep. So what does that do as far as customer lifetime value? That makes the next sale a thousand percent easier and almost a guarantee. And then the next and the next and the next. So what we're doing, when we're actually creating a brand, pre-sale branding post, uh, and during the sale branding and then post-sale branding, 95% of any of your competitors, anyone listening to this, 95% of them ignore post-sale branding. And when I say post-sale branding, that doesn't just mean, oh, you mean like when Amazon just like says, hey, you bought this, here's an email, and so maybe you'll like this too. Is that post-sale no. branding? Yes, it is. But it's, it's a message. That's an email. I'm sure. talking about, yeah. I'm talking the experience. What are you going to do to elevate just the normal transaction into, wow, those guys blew me away. And I'll give you a very simple example when I moved out here. Please. It was within, it was within... I think a year of me moving out here from the East Coast. And my wife and I, we were going to a movie in a nearby mall. And I, I ended up, um, I was like, you know what? We're here early. Why don't we go around, walk around the mall? And, I, and we went to a place. And I was like, oh, great. You know what? I'm going to get some sneakers here. This is awesome. So I got some sneakers. The guy took great care of us. But here was the crazy part. I mean, he took great, great care of us. Got some good sneakers. He gave some good advice. Six days later, I receive a handwritten, freaking folded over card that said, hey, by the way, how did your... And I I was like, where did I freaking just move to Mayberry? What the hell is going on? (laughs) I couldn't be... I was was like, you've got to be kidding me. And of course, he had my loyalty from that point on. It was a little gesture. It can be something like that. Or in the case of the chocolate company... Here was an example. I made sure that that box was not only gorgeous, but was so, that sucker would survive a nuclear holocaust, okay? I'm saying that thing was built, was so sturdy. Women, and I know it from husbands who once they learned that I was the guy that did it, they're like, oh, you're the guy. Because they (laughs) refused to throw the boxes away. They would always reuse the boxes for recipes or for sewing stuff Mm. or for this or that. Those boxes had an afterlife. That's post-sales branding. I had a little mini billboard in their home all mm-hmm. the freaking time, and that was smart, and it was intentional. You know, yeah. So these are examples that you want customer lifetime value. You need to build future into your brand, not just, uh, you know, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, let's, let's do it good, and let's, let's get the transaction, and then let's follow up and hammer them with an email sequence. You know what? You mm-hmm. and everybody else. You and everybody else, trust me, if you're doing the same shit as everyone else, you're doing the same shit as everyone else. It's not because, but we're doing it. That doesn't make it special. Just like your passion isn't going to be the differentiator that separates your brand from your competitors. You've got to, you've got to look at the world from out there inward. We're all being hit with a shit ton of noise. It is deafening. We have to outsmart that. If we're going to outperform that level of noise, we have to outsmart it. We have to outstrategize it. We have to outthink it. We have to we have to like go. How the hell are we going to just totally reframe, change the change the game entirely, change the conversation entirely, change the standard entirely? Yeah, I think you brought up those pillars, right? Like the pre-sell, during sell, post-sell. Um, and that's coming out of your new book, if I'm correct, right? No, I, actually, you talk actually, about I that? covered that in Brand Intervention, actually. I covered that in Brand well, Intervention. Well, I must not have dog-eared that page. I apologize. <laughs> but <laughs> let's use this as an opportunity to transition into something that you told me in your new book, because I haven't read that one yet. You haven't, you haven't given me that one yet. Yep. Um, but the preview, which you said, I might need to burn this after this here. <laughs> um, I'm talking about that magic ingredient 
that made everything from the Seinfeld sitcom to the Rolling Stones, PayPal to the Rat Pack, and Motown in the Declaration of Independence not only possible, but inevitable. The book's called uh, Rich Brand, Poor Brand. Um, what did you mean when you're saying this? Because I think this is where you're getting at with this, where it's like cutting through all of that noise. What is this? The bottom line is, is that brands, it's not only limited to brands. It's, well, it's, uh, put it away. Brands are, are a reflection of culture and culture is a reflection of people, right? We, that's mm -hmm. very simple, very logical. Okay. So the thing is, is that we live in a, we live in a, I, at this point, I think culturally we are, we have taken many steps backward. I think there's, there's an overemphasis on being overly safe. There's a, there's an overemphasis of being, I'm willing to be insulted. There's no emphasis on, well, let me, let me just say things in the most vanilla way possible. So that way it may be me, it may be meaningless, but at least I will not have offended anybody. And you mm -hmm. know what? Sure. It's like that, that's, that's not going to get us anywhere. So that overly cautious, that, that, that element has resulted in us diluting and compromising our most vital ingredient, which is our willingness, that level of conviction that level of ownership, that level of undeniable, almost contagious, you know when you're in the presence of someone who's got that because yeah. you're like, man, they are freaking all in. They are not going, yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It reminds me of one size fits all, right? One size fits all is another way of saying one size fits absolutely nobody yeah. or maybe just a handful of people. But I think that that's what we've done with a lot of companies, a lot of brands, as we have said, how do we make sure that this, this brand fits everybody and not necessarily fit from an actual size standpoint, but like that it's absolutely right for everybody. But the reality is it can't be right for everybody. And so how do we do a better job? Let's just say it's lazy. It's lazy marketing. But do a better job of knowing who your ideal customers are and be absolutely irreplaceable to that group of people. Yes, yes. And the, and the bottom line is, is, that, is that what most people don't get is they're looking for shortcuts. Well, you know what? Insight is the ultimate shortcut. And the playing the long game is the ultimate shortcut. I mean, that's the, that's the bottom line. It, and it's like, I, and, I, and, I, and I always find it fascinating whenever a company, I'm talking to a company, and there's this desperation. They, they got to get sales now. They got to, da, 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 da. it's like, well, mm -hmm. wait a second. You're coming to me after you've already banged up your freaking vehicle, run it into like every wall that you could possibly see. And you're asking me, yep. how come it can't go from zero to 60 in 2.5 seconds? Excuse me, you screwed it up before you ever came here. So it's like, so now are we going to have a real conversation or are you going to give me this bullshit scenario? Because if you're that desperate, I already know that lack of money is not the cause of, uh, of, of a company's problems. Lack of money is a mm -hmm. symptom. I want yeah. everyone to get that. Lack of money is not the cause. Lack of money is not a cause of your problems, and lack of customers is not a cause of your problems. Those are symptoms. And the bottom line is, is the only way you're going to remedy this stuff is by actually finding the cause, the levers that will move things forward. And sometimes you got to freaking get really eat a big dose of freaking whip out the whipped cream and 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 your and your pie and your little pie thing and pull out. You're going to eat some humble pie. You can eat sure. the freaking humble pie with whipped cream all over that sucker because you screwed up. You yeah. screwed up. You made some bad calls, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with making yeah. bad calls. What's wrong is making bad calls and then saying how right they are. Bullshit. Mm -hmm. If you screwed up, the best leaders will be able to say, you know what? I that was the stupidest move I made. I, I, made, a bad I made a bad choice. For X, Y, Z reasons. You know, this is what I did. I didn't correctly look at it. I was looking at it through filtered lenses. I was whatever. Yeah. There's uh, a lot of people may not realize this, but this is actually how your doctor works a little bit more. You, you, this seems counterintuitive, but your doctor says you've got these three or four different symptoms. 80% of the time, those symptoms are this. Here's the medicine. This is diagnostic to a point. Take this medicine. If you get better, I was right. If you don't get better, come back and see me and we'll figure something else out. But to a point, that's what we need to do for brands sometimes too, is we say, hey, look, when I see these couple of things going on, most likely there's, a, there's an issue here. And if you just do A-B tests, you're never going to get anywhere, kind of to your point. You need to take this pill and it's going to be a pill that's a little bit hard to swallow, but it's going to have some effect. And that effect is going to tell you if we made the right decision or not. If it works, great. We were right. 
If it doesn't work, okay, we were wrong, but we've at least very clearly identified that this was not the thing that you needed to do. Yeah. I, um, I mean, I, I just, I mean, you just reminded me of something, which is like, I actually, I actually ended up um, rebranding a, a naturopath who helps women with a drug free solution for menopause. And when I was, mm. when I was branding this company, here's the thing I learned. Um, hormone imbalanced hormones. Those are not the cause of menopause. Those are actually a symptom. Mm. I learned that from her. I was like, no shit. Cause if you're approaching it from the standpoint, Oh, well, that's the cause of your, da, 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 da. Sure. are you ever going to come up with a, a workable solution? Hell no. But if you realize right. it as a symptom, that changes mm. everything. So mm-hmm. it's always very, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fanatical when it comes to really finding what's the cause of this decline. What's the, what's the thing that's going to shift things dramatically. Mm-hmm. So let's say um, hypothetical, let's say that I run a, an e-commerce retail brand, let's say doing hundred million but only 5% of that is e-commerce. So five, we've got 5 million that's going towards e-commerce. The brand is very much based on all of the creative we have is very much catalog based creative. We don't have a lot of good assets. And let's say that I'm the director of e-commerce for this brand and I'm bought into this. I get your book, I read it and I say, yep, this is what needs to happen. Um, how do I get buy-in from senior management that we need to invest in branding when senior management may think, this is my baby. I love it. It's worked so well for us so far. How do you go about, what are the things that you could say to get buy-in? Very simple. So the thing is, is you, you take a you take quick, quick inventory, take quick inventory and you say, okay, what's our competition doing? What's our competition doing? What, what, what are the metrics? Say, oh, okay, our top, our top um, competitor, they, they have a, the, 25% of their sales is e-commerce. Um, or, or, or not our top, our second top competitor is 25. Our top competitor or second or, or another top competitor is 40. And our top, top competitor has 70% is, is e-commerce based. Now we go, holy crap. Now we have a barometer by which to go, they're 70 and we're five. Now we can make, mm. now we realize You've got to you've got to be able to look at and understand what what are the what are the numbers what's possible in this space, and at the same time now that's on known territory. Sometimes you're going to have unknown territory. Like for example, when when uh, Steve Jobs said we're going to do retail stores, and I loved all the naysayers at the time who were like, "Oh, it's going to fail. That's ridiculous. That's stupid. That's impossible." And there were sure. all these naysayers. Well, it's the number one retail it, the, the sales per square foot. It, it trumps everybody. But the interesting thing is I remember when they were developing the stores, nine months into the development of the stores, they were using the model of the existing stores, meaning mm-hmm. how yeah. products were laid out. So like if you and I go to a, a Best Buy, it's crap. You just see, okay, there's, there's, there's 45 laptops. Here's 25 dry- dryers. Here's 50 TVs. <laughs> it's just like, it's like there's no anything. Well, Apple, yeah. after nine months of doing this, I remember the, the guy who was in charge came to Steve, said, we got it all wrong. And Steve blew up. He said, what the hell do you mean we got it all wrong? And what they did is they built the stores around interests, meaning, oh, okay, this quadrant was mm-hmm. video. This quadrant was create for creative. This quadrant was for gaming. This quadrant was for music. Um, and, you, and you could come in and actually simply just try the stuff out. Not in a mm-hmm. high pressure scenario, but it actually became an extension of their own curiosity. If a brand is not fostering curiosity on the part of prospects, you are leaving hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue on the table. Mm-hmm. If you are not fostering curiosity, it's like, hmm, I want to know more. Just shouting at people the same shit they've heard from everybody else for decades is not a smart way to do business or do branding. It's like we need I mean, if I'm if I'm not helping a client intrigue the imagination and curiosity on the part of their prospects. So it's like, wow, I didn't know that that was possible. Well, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Da, 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 da. And hitting on all these points just seduce me in a nice way at every point yeah. of contact. And so it's, that, that's really what a brand needs to do. It's like 
you're you're in the, you're in the the industry of building curiosity, nice high quality seduction, not low gr- low grade crap, you know, and not just the cheesy little hey offer buy now fifty percent off da, 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 and all that kind of crap. That's going to destroy your LTV. That destroy you don't want those customers. That's right. Um, this this next part uh, might just absolutely blow up on us. Uh, and if that's the case, we can cut it out. But I wanted to kind of imagine like a scenario where we run through this. We've got a lot of customers that are shoe brands, apparel brands. Um, and oftentimes, to your point, there's nothing that really separates them in any significant way from everybody else out there. Yep. How do those brands, brands that are selling water in a can, what is the biggest way that a brand like that, and I want to keep it more on apparel though, apparel, shoes, things like that. What are some ways that they can cut through the noise instead of just going after features? We have this material or whatever, because it's like, that's fine. That works for a small segment of people, but most people don't care if you have this material. What are the better ways to approach cutting through the noise as an apparel brand? Well, I, here's what I would do. I'll tell you very exactly what I would do. I would, I would, Take, I would take inventory. I'd, I would do three columns, and I'd go pre-sales branding, during sales branding, post-sales branding. Okay, in terms of pre-sales branding, which is everything from your name to your slogan to your positioning to your, to your advertising to et cetera, that's pre-sale, okay? And then it's during sale, which is like whether mm-hmm. it's online or if it's a brick and mortar, it's an in a location, da 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 and then the post-sale. It's like take each one of those and say, what, and list out, take inventory. What is everyone doing? Mm-hmm. And what are we doing? Fill out those columns. Fill them out. What's everyone doing? What are we doing? How much of, and then take it, take start now, do an analysis. How much of what we are doing is simply our version of what everyone else is doing? If you're at 90%, if you're at 80%, you are leaving money on the table. You are not building a brand, you're selling product. Don't confuse mm-hmm. those two things. And you could sometimes be selling product, like you said earlier. You said, hey, we can get the 10 million, da 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 da. Yeah, at a certain point, but then it's going to plateau out. And you go, well, why did it plateau? Because you didn't build a brand. You're just, you're just driving a sales machine. Mm-hmm. And yes, you need to have a strong sales machine. But if you, have built, if you build a sales machine on top of a brand, how many people need to actually ever be sold when they walk into an Apple store? Zero. They walk in with their credit card. And it's like, I want that color and I want that much memory. Thank you. Boom. Yep. And, oh, and by the way, while they're walking back, oh, and I'll take those earbuds, and I'll take that microphone, and I'll take that, that, that. It's like, boom, $5,000 later, $10,000 later. Great. And they're happy as a clam. Good. Yep. So the bottom line is, is you take it, you take those three pillars, and you then you go, okay, what percentage of what we're doing is essentially our variation, our spin on what everyone else is doing? If it's a high percentage, you're in the shitter. You need mm-hmm. to you need to widen that gap. You need to go, okay, we are not thinking big enough. We are not playing big enough. We're not making we're, – we're taking incremental changes and think that they're going to actually be noticeable. That's – no. It's like get, get, a, get a bit bold. It's like, you know what? what? What do you need to do to widen that gap? There's your $64,000 question. What do you, what steps do you need to take to widen that gap? Is it the experience mm-hmm. when they get in the store? Is it the experience when they get online? Is it is it something is it having something remarkable, something magical? What are you doing after the sale? What are you doing after the sale? Are you going to blow my mind? I'll give you I'll give you a perfect simple example. And it's not it's not apparel related, but it is absolutely from the standpoint of buying something off totally the catalog. Fine. So so um Two, two, uh, two, one East Coast and one West Coast um, uh, artisanal food catalogs. One Williams Sonoma, and then the other one was uh, was Diamicos, Diamicos. And so, no, not Diamicos. It's it's on the on the East Coast. With, with the, begins begins with a D. I, I haven't gotten their catalog in a while, so I don't know what the hell they're doing. But the thing is, they both had chocolate torts, like flourless chocolate torts. I'm a sucker for a really good flourless chocolate tort. I look at them, I could really not hardly tell the difference. Price is just about the same. I'm like, well, shit, which one should I take? And so I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm getting both of them. And I'll see which one's better. Okay. Nice. So I get, I get both. Well, one of them comes. One of them comes. And, and it's like, 
there, nicely presented, and it's just the tort. The other one comes, it's there, it's the tort, and on the top, it says, you know, this is the flowerless chocolate tort, and on the back side of this little cart, probably about three by, three by five, three by four, on the back of the cart is the recipe for bourbon whipped cream, which they say is the most mm-hmm. wonderful accompaniment of that. Now, uh, it's a post-sales branding. Let's see. What did it cost them? Probably about two cents to print up that card. What did it cost them in terms of labor to add that freaking card on top of that thing? Probably, I don't know, whatever, whatever. It didn't matter. Which one was I going to remain loyal to? Because I mentioned it earlier. I'm going to mention it again because I guarantee no one understood it to the extent that they need to. I talked about Mm -hmm. include the amount more future than your competition. They gave me more future. They thought ahead of the steps that I would be taking. That's how you include future. What are the next steps that your customer will inevitably take? You could do that in the pre-sales side. You could do that in the during sales side. You could do it in the post-sales side. What's the amount of future? Okay, so they're going here. Don't we love it when we go to a site and the site is like, they not only have that, but they now are providing the information that was our next question. And it's like, mm-hmm. whoa, cool. They knew our journey. And it was like, wow, bang, there it is. So what happens is, is you must include and an- anticipate the next steps. And that's what I mean when I say include future in with everything. The more, who, you know who wins at the end of the day? The company that in- has the most amount of future incorporated into each of those steps. Who wins the business? Who has more customer lifetime value? Who has more brand loyalty? It is the company that builds more future into each of those steps. You build more future, you will be the winner. You know, and it's commonly said, hey, the one that wins is the one with the best story. Yeah, that's true. But the bottom line is the one who wins over the the one amongst those who have the best story, it's going to be the one with the most future built into each of these three columns that we've been talking about. You do that, you will kick ass. That's how you build it. It's brilliant. I love it. Um, I'm going to move us from the future to the past. (laughs) Because I do also like to talk a little bit about who is David Pryor. And so I want to talk about your childhood. Um, Let's just say, maybe not even childhood, but just why do you see branding in a way that's so different from other people? I would say it's probably a number of different reasons. I mean, one is is that for those of that, for those that are seeing this, if you look where my fingers pointed, that's a that's a painting I did of George Harrison when I was about fifteen or sixteen years old. A, a, a lot of this artwork you see over here, and there's tons of artwork over here that you don't see, and there's paintings over here, all kinds of stuff in the office, and, and that which you've been to, where we where we did that. Right, and I didn't know you made that though. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. And so the thing is, is that is it? So I come from I come from. Um, the standpoint of like, I know what it is to actually create, you know, the, the most frustrating was when I was starting my career in New York and I saw art directors and I, and I, cause I, cause I was a designer letter. Initially I was just the logo designer. That's how I started. And I would work with art directors who couldn't even draw a sketch to describe to me what they had in their mind and their mm. directing. Like how the freaking hell can you do that? You can't even draw it's a, it, so, so I come to it with that standpoint. The other thing is that I also was a drummer in my teens. So I've always, mm. I've always been a big, a big lover and admirer of music. So I appreciate, and I, and my music goes everything from Motown to the Beatles, to the freak, you know, to, 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 to jazz, to classical. I mean, I cover the gamut because there's there's a certain aesthetic that I appreciate, but I also appreciate there's a contrast. It's like mm-hmm. something can't like for example, a, a music can't go on, nor can a story go on or a movie go on. It's like da dum ba 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 dum. We're like, okay, what is it, is there going to be a change here? What's going on? We're like now getting restless. It's like uh, hello. So there's got to be like you know, it's got to be like. Dun, bum, bum, uh, dun, 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 uh. It's like all of a sudden, whoa, okay, we're getting it now. So yeah. get, so something to, so there's got to be a bit of that tension, a bit of that something yep. that keeps us hooked, 
that keeps us connected. And so I'm looking at, and, and when I grew up in New York, we went to, we would oftentimes go to Greenwich Village. Um, and we would go to where, where there was the, the art festival and mm -hmm. around Washington Square Park. And I'd, and I'd look at the street performers and I'd smell the foods being cooked in the street. And I'd look at the different art. And I always was intrigued by something that would make me do a double take. And I'd go, what the hell? It's like, what is that? What is that mm -hmm. thing? What is that smell? What is that sound? What is that amazing note that that person just sang? Um, and so things that, that just cut through, right? I was always fascinated with things that cut through, right? It's like, you know, there was no shortage of visual stimuli in Greenwich Village. But what was the thing that just, boom, that totally made me go, whoa, I got to walk up and really check this artwork out. Or, you know, okay, there's 40 different street performers. Why am I, I'm blown away by that one. That really, and I wanted to know more about that. Sure. Come full circle to what we talked about earlier about where it is incumbent upon us. We must own our roles in commanding the curiosity and attention of those that we seek to communicate with. If we can't do that, get the hell out of business. Mm -hmm. Just work for somebody. You yeah. got If you're going to be an entrepreneur, if you're going to be a CEO, if you're going to be a build a brand, you need to be willing. How willing are you to actually command someone's attention, to actually do something to enough of a degree that you're willing to actually pique their curiosity? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I mean, that's why, I mean, I love, I love showing up at, a, at an event and talking and knowing that the first 15 seconds are going to be, have I hooked them or not? Mm -hmm. Have I done something to disrupt it, to disrupt their, what they expected? Because if I just show up and I give them what they expect, will I be acceptable? Yes. Will I be memorable? No. Get that difference. Will I be acceptable? Yeah. yeah. Being acceptable is not an achievement. Yeah. It, look, someone laying dead in a coffin is acceptable, okay? They're not <laughs> offending anybody. Right. That's not an achievement. Yeah. But being memorable. Every moment of our interaction is a moment. It's, it, we can leave a morsel, a breadcrumb of, a, of our legacy with every interaction. That's yeah. what we can do. And if we're not doing that, that is a forfeited opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. You also talked uh, earlier, we were talking about books and podcasts, and you had a good stance on books and podcasts as far as basically saying that too often people get books that are about topics, uh, subjects that they're interested in versus ones that you can actually learn something. What do you mean by that? I will admit freely and I'm very comfortable admitting it because I know everyone listening to this is guilty of the same thing. How many books do we actually have on our bookshelves that we actually bought that we thought was a great idea, but we never actually read? I mean, it's like, let's get real. Sure. Let's get real. Yeah. I, it's on your book list. More, and you're like, I'll read it. I'll read it. I'll read it. I, and you don't. Yeah, yeah. Exa exactly. Exactly. And, and, the, and the cool thing is, and, and, and here, and here's the cool thing for those that actually, if, if you're just learning about this for the first time and you're saying, just so you know, like, that's why I wrote my book with such big freaking type, okay? I wanted to punch it in the love. face. I wanted to punch it in the face so that you didn't have to basically search for the goodies. Yeah. I, I don't like, I don't, I don't, I mean, there are some folks, and, and look, and, and, and there's this, this one, one particular person sort of in my space I respect his, his business acumen and his achievements. I find him boring as boring as shit. I think he is <laughs> as exciting. I think he's as, as, as exciting as watching tofu come to room temperature on my freaking kitchen <laughs> counter. Okay. And, hey, and so I'm not, I'm not going to name him, but the bottom line is, is he's boring as shit, but he's a, but he's a smart business person. Sure. He's built, he's built a, a decent brand. Would I want to, would I trade places with him? Hell no. Because I'd be bored out of my freaking wits. I'd want to hit my head against the wall. We, you know, it, to me, if we're going to attract people to buy a book or if we're going to attract them 
to uh, watch a, a YouTube video or attract them to listen to our podcast, we need to reward them. We need to reward them with with actionable things. And I think there are some people that really do that well. I think Alex Hormozzi is really good. Yeah, you know, I, agree. I think Alex is. I think I think he's really smart. I mean, and Alex, if you're listening to this, you're an asshole because you didn't accept my invitation yet. I invited you to actually like get on a thing with me. So, Alex, if you are listening to this, or 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 Layla, if you are listening to this as well, tell Alex. Say, Alex, what are you a freaking asshole? What are you a butthead? You didn't freaking take David Breyer's invitation, you asshole. Call him up now. Dude. Shots fired. <laughs> <laughs> And so That's good. And I will not arm wrestle with you, Alex. I know you'll kick my ass, <laughs> but eat, eat shit and die, buddy. You didn't freaking respond. So <laughs> anyway, the basic thing is, is, but he rewards you. He gives you some yeah. good stuff. Um, you know, but, and, and there's some, you know, I think Seth Godin has, his, uh, has some, some great moments. I think Simon Sinek has some great moments, yep. but I, but, but I'll, I'll, let's, let's be honest. I was blown away with Simon Sinek's, uh, you know, start with why, um, uh, you know, mm-hmm. his, his TED Talk. That's how I first discovered him. Yep. Then yep. I then I was like, if he can achieve this shit in 18 minutes, his book must blow my freaking mind. I got the book. I was very, I, I was completely heartbroken. Hmm. I learned nothing more from the book. The best part of the book was in that, was in that. I didn't, I never needed to do, he didn't give me more. He didn't take me to a new place. Sure. It was just the longer version. The, 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 the TED Talk was the Cliff Notes version which was great. That's all I wanted. So we must respect and reward because people are going to, what's going to happen is people are going to first invest with us. They're going to invest their time. Mm -hmm. That's in the form of trust. The question becomes, are we going to reward that trust where they've invested five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is, are we going to reward that trust with something valuable? If we have not, we have lost that relationship. If we have rewarded them with something, then it will graduate where they're like, oh, maybe David has something more valuable to say in addition. I'll watch something else. Oh, wow. I, I was rewarded again. Oh, wow. Now, now if, we become, if we become continually re- rewarding them for their trust in us, that will eventually ev- evolve where now we're an authority mm-hmm. and we're tr- a trusted source. And it will result in business or referrals. And that's as true for apparel as it is for food. As it, How many people think that Gordon Ramsay is amazing, but have yet never, not yet eaten in one of his restaurants? But guaranteed. Sure. If there, but if there's some place where it's like, hey, like Vegas or someplace, like, oh, there's a Gordon Ramsay thing. How quickly will they? It's like back, he's got the street cred. He's, he has rewarded yep. you and me with value because of, whether whether you're watching his Master Chef because where he's more in a mental role, or he's going for the full fiery theatrics, the pyrotechnics on freaking you know Hell's Kitchen, where he's like yeah. beating everybody's ass to the to the ground. Uh, but the bottom line is he, he's still rewarding whether it's entertainment yeah. or information. Yeah, you have met some interesting people over the course of your career here. Yep. Um, one personally that I have enjoyed uh, is Damon John. Writing the foreword to your book, and I got to ask, how does that happen? How do let's say I write a book in the future? How do I make sure I get either Damon John or a Damon John like character to write the foreword to my book? How, what was it like meeting him? Tell me the story here. Okay, so here's basically how it happened. So I I had at the time <clears throat> I was I had a I have a column I have about 30, 40 articles on Fast Company at the time. Probably about the second season into Shark Tank, that was like my my wife my, and I our guilty pleasure. It's like we would stay home and watch Shark Tank. We freaking loved it. We thought this Love was it. the coolest thing. And so we were like, it was like I think it was just the second season. And we're like, this is cool. So I was like, you know, I, I really haven't seen anybody really write about like what is it that makes the difference of those that get a deal an investor and those mm. that didn't. I said, so I'm going to do my own analysis. What is it? And so I wrote my own article on that. And it was a great article. And it was well thought out. And I just would gave my viewpoint. Within a couple of days, Damon John tweeted, 
This is the best article ever written on Shark Tank. Wow. And I was like, son of a bitch. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, how cool is that shit, right? So I immediately, I see this come up on my feed, and I'm like, and I'm like, thanks, man. I said, I didn't know him at the time. Didn't I know him at the time? And so um, I was like, that's freaking cool. And I, and so immediately my, you know, I, I'm, I'm like open door. I'm like, how can I leverage this? How can I build mm -hmm. upon this? So I immediately thought, what can I do above the level of expectation? What can I do to exceed expectations? Because everything I've been talking about that you and I have been talking about here, it's like, it's recognizing there's a, a bar that's been set either mm -hmm. deliberately or, un, or, or intentionally or not. There's a bar that's been set. Sometimes that bar is low. Sometimes that bar is high. But it's an agreed upon bar, you know, whether through just actions or through customer expectations or customer demands. But it exists. And to the degree that we only meet that bar and that band is the degree that we fail. To the degree that we go beyond that is the degree that we succeed. So with that being said, I looked at this and I was like, you know, I'm going to. So I need I need I need to like. I need to wow Damon. How can I do this? I said, you know, I, f I, want, I, want, to, I want to write an article about Damon. And I'm going to tell him that. I, I'm going to tell him. I'm going to say, Damon, you need. And I, by this time, I'd already thought it out. And all this probably took 20 minutes. It was like, this is real, uh, my, my world is going. Like, <laughs> and yeah. So I'm like, all right. So I came up with an amazing, a killer headline. And I said, you need, you need, you need a slogan that's just killer. And now I could tell by the speed with which he was responding, it's him. It's not someone doing his social mm -hmm. media for him. And he goes, cool, man. Like what? And this is what I texted back. I messaged back. I said, a Damon is a girl's best friend. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and for those that might be young, young folk listening to this, that's from a diamond is a girl's best friend, a very famous line from, from an advertising. I'm, I think that, I think that's De Beers actually from their, Sounds from, right. you know? And so, so if you're, if you're very, if you're young and you've never heard that before, you could Google it. A diamond is a girl's best friend. There you go. But a Damon is a girl's best friend. And he was like, that's awesome. Right. I mean, he loved it. Right. <laughs> and I said, cool, man, let's schedule a time. I'd love to actually do an article based on this. And then we'll do an interview. He goes, cool. Let's set it up. So we set Amazing. it up. Amazing. That's how it happened. So I didn't do it with the agenda of, oh, maybe I can attract the attention of one of the sharks. But I was like, I was like, I'm just going to do my thing. Yep. It's the same way that I, and, and I'll tell you as a side note, it's the same way that I actually met Claude Silver, who's Gary Vaynerchuk's number two. Yeah. Yep. It's like, I literally, I saw an article on her and I was like, you're amazing. I was, I was, and I watched a few of her videos and I immediately fell in love with her. I mean, she's incredibly special, a very unique, a very unique being really from the heart, a very, very phenomenal person. And so I just simply sent her a message on LinkedIn. And I just said, I just said, I want you to know. I said, I found you, I saw this and my jaw hit the ground. I said, you're amazing. I just want you to know that's just from me to you. You blew me away. You're amazing. And I want to thank you for being who you are. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you. And that was it. No expectation. And four days later, she was, she was so open and she was like, Oh my God. She was like, thank you so much. That's like, she was like, totally, you know, she wasn't like, thanks so much. We'll be in touch. It wasn't like one of those. It's, sure. it, she didn't have that layer of corporate bureau, bureaucratic bullshit. You know, that's, you know, a cement suit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh. And so, um, but that's basically how it happened. That's how, that's how Damon. So when, by the time they came for, you know, so Damon and I started working on some little pet projects and stuff like that together. And I ended up then, by the time I was doing my book, I said, Damon, I'd love for you to write my, write my forward. And it was that, you know, it's, I'm very, I will tell anybody, my own personal philosophy and policy is when I am dealing with VIPs, I'm very, very deliberate and intentional with what I ask for. And very intentional about what I don't ask for. I don't, I don't take lightly. I know that they're being bombarded. And again, it's the ability to yeah. look at the at the world, just like you, what I've been talking about. You got to look at the 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 world of your audience, 
That's mm-hmm. my audience. Yeah. I am not, I'm, I'm not going to ignore the fact. I mean, I, I literally, I remember, I remember asking Damon at one point, I said, dude, how many pitches do you get a day? He goes, a hundred. Yeah, I don't doubt it. Every day. Every yeah. day. And people come to him, hey, my thing's special. Bullshit, you think your thing's special. The fact yeah. that you're even thinking that and you're coming up to him and thinking that he hasn't already been pitched 65 times shows the level of naivety that you have. Get real. So it's just the wider our awareness can be to all the sides of the relationship, the better off we are. That reminds me a little bit of how I got my first article on, I believe it was Entrepreneur at the time. The subject line that I put in there, knowing your audience, I said, another boring pitch from a mediocre writer. (laughs) I thought everybody's talking about how great they are. What do I put this in there? It did backfire on me. He actually replied back. He was like, well, then why would I even read it? (laughs) I was like, oh, no, no, no. Wait a minute. Hold on. Uh, But I got his attention and it it turned into eventually me getting on Entrepreneur. Good. Um, Good. There you go. One of the other things I like to talk about then are, are like just to say silly quirks or talents, things like that. Um, and when we were talking about this, we jokingly said that you have a very good French accent. It is much better than most people. Mine, unfortunately, sounds a little bit like a sick Lumiere from The Beast. Uh, yes, let's it, hear your... it is. Uh, when, when, I, when I listen to you, it makes me kind of like stomach. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is disgusting. <laughs> You, when you Americans try to stand like a like a French, it is a, it is a, it is a cultural insult. It is a slap in the face. <laughs> you are disgusting. So, you make me just sick to my stomach. <laughs> that sounds very French. Um, you actually, uh, it reminds me even yours is much better, but it reminds me of um, Pink Panther. Oh, who is the the guy who played in that now? Um, drawing a blank on his name, but he's like hamburger. Peter Sellers. Hamburger. Peter Sellers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hamburger, hamburger. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was so bad. He was so bad. It was, it was bad in a good way. But he bad was in a good way, yes. Um, I want to wrap it up. You talked about um, rewarding trust. Is there some way that we can reward the trust that people have given us? And so we've talked about a lot of things that cover uh, the gamut of branding. There's so much more we could go into. Is there any other thing that you would like to leave as like parting words of wisdom to people who are thinking about branding in some way, shape or form? Yeah. Um, Stop sitting on the sidelines. Go into action fast. Find out what the hell works. Find out what doesn't work. Just stop. Stop the stop the tentativeness. Stop the test. It's like, okay, we're, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to read, you know, we're going to read this and we're going to watch these YouTubes and we're going to do some tutorials and we're going to uh, bullshit. Do you know, I mean, it's like, like, you know, about my, you know, about my masterclass. So, I mean, so during mm-hmm. my nine week masterclass, I mean, I, I put, I put, I put a hundred entrepreneurs through the masterclass. They've, they probably collectively had generated about 789 million uh, in, in revenue uh, since completing. Okay. Wow. Um, the thing that's crazy though, is that the amount of them that didn't know what branding was until I forced them to look at it, forced them to answer questions, forced them to start working it out. They couldn't look the greatest, your, the greatest challenge that anybody's going to have is one, you're going to, you may initially think we can do it all ourselves. Mm-hmm. That's one potential barrier. Another potential barrier is we know all about our product. We don't need anybody's help. You're full of shit. Okay. <laughs> if you're thinking that, I will tell you because I love you, you're full of shit. Trust yeah. me, you're full of shit. You're leaving money on the table. I already know that, that oh, just by that admission, if you're saying that or thinking that, you're already are, are, are easily seeing 25 to 50% less actual revenue and income than if you actually looked at it honestly, because the bottom line is, is you knowing about it is important. Your knowledge of your product, your knowledge of your service is important. It's one of your greatest assets. It's also one of your greatest liabilities because you're too freaking close to it. Mm -hmm. You don't know what's important because not all the things are equally important. Not every feature is equally important. Not every feature might even be a point that even differentiates you from your competition. So it's not like, well, we know what's important. Great. 
If all your competition knows the same thing, then you're all just adding to the noise, which comes back to the beginning of this, which is what everyone of you should do anyway. You should listen to this entire thing again because this conversation was freaking, there was some fire and gold on this, man. This is, people should Absolutely. be paid. People should be sending you and me checks after listening to this. <laughs> this is, there, there's some, but the thing is, is it comes down to differentiation. It's yeah. like, if we don't differentiate, you're not even going to get on their radar. So it doesn't matter, but we're better then. Great. I'm glad you're better. I hope that you're better. I want you to be better, but that doesn't mean you're going to, you know, how many starving artists are there? How many starving genius entrepreneurs are there who have made the most incredible breakthrough in X, Y, Z, but they couldn't brand it for crap. Yeah. So the thing is, is that that's the, that's the stuff. That's the stuff to look, look for. Just like, don't, don't be tentative. If you're going to try it yourself, try it yourself and do it fast. Mm -hmm. Do it fast and do it deliberately. Don't go, well, I'll devote 30 minutes a day to bullshit. That's a cowardly move. Acknowledge it's a cowardly move. That means you're scared. Okay, good. It's okay to be scared. Now, just get the hell over it and just like freaking lean in. Seriously, do it yeah. for real. Um, and then you'll know if you have the stomach for it or not. If you, and you, and if you, are, if you do, congratulations. That's incredible. If you don't, Get the expertise of someone like myself. There aren't many that are like me, but you know, but you at least now you now know me. And mm -hmm. so the bottom line is, is you should you should go out and buy yourself a freaking lottery ticket. Obviously, the fact that you've been listening to this and you're here listening to this right now, just obviously you're doing something right. Because you're listening, you're following William, you're following me. Boom, there it is. Boom. David, if people wanted to follow you more. They wanted to interact with you. Follow, where is the best way for them to stay in touch with you? Best way is certainly go to risingabovethenoise.com. Rising, R-I-S-I-N-G, risingabovethenoise.com. And you and that's where you'll have the, the entire website and where I have over 300 actual articles where I show you brands that I, I, mean, I, I take you through the journey. It's like I show you. Here was the before. Here was the after. Here was the result. Here's what we found. I am, and I show you the actual stuff. Buy my book, Brand Intervention. And you can certainly reach out to me on LinkedIn. If you're kind of like, hey, you know what? I heard you and William. And it's like, and, and you're like, and you're like, and you know what? And by the way, I really look closely at your two beards and I like William's better. I'm like, you know, I won't hold that against you. I'm okay with that. If you like William's beard better, that's fine. I'm not going to tell you to eat shit and die unless you say something really stupid after that. Now, so the thing is, is, you know, so there, risingabovethenoise.com, brand intervention, and reach out to me on LinkedIn. You could, and there's other social channels, my YouTube channel, et cetera, but those are the three good core ones to, to uh, connect with me on. It's amazing. I appreciate it. Uh, David, it's been so good talking to you today. I appreciate you sharing your wisdom, time, and knowledge with us. Thousand percent, man. I had a blast. I had a blast. Okay. Thanks again, and thanks everyone for listening. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Up Arrow podcast with William Harris. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.